Hey guys, Swim here, and welcome to my deck guide for my Queensguard list. Uh, uh, first off, I'd like to start by apologizing that this had to take an extra few days longer than I would have liked. I really would have liked to have been able to get it out a few days ago, but I couldn't due to unforeseen circumstances. Anyway, uh, this list is the Queensguard list that I made in day one of the open beta, and it's turned out to be very good. Ultimately, the Savage Bearers are a major, major inclusion to this list, as are the Shield Maidens, and they do a lot of work in terms of this list. Ultimately, the um, Queensguards here, the objective with the Queensguards is to basically discard them from your deck with Bran, and play them out later and they just chain summon themselves. The Savage Bears really help the deck strategy because of course you can play them early and they generate one value for every card the opponent plays including summoned units which it didn't used to do which means for example if the opponent plays a Cilantro Harpy you can smack everything it does five damage immediately popping the eggs and then smacking the Harpies that come out very huge cards. Uh, most notably, it will be able to kill Priestesses of Freya's or Vikovara Medics before their effects activate. So, ultimately, a very powerful card and a ma major addition to this list. Uh, Clan Hamey Skull is basically just the one of bronze filler. Uh, could run a second first light instead. Ultimately, there's there's a few cards that are gonna be like slight uh, tech options or variations. You might notice that this list um, will be at least one or two cards off from the Gwent DB list at the time of uh, writing. Um, and these are just things I'm trying out. I wouldn't read too much into it, but. I'll keep the Gwent DB list upload updated with basically what I think is generally going to be the best performing. Um, Clan of Great Raider is going to be the third discard off the brand, which you will see uh, later when I'm going into the guide of things. Roach just helps you push for round one, which is pretty valuable as a silver, although I might want Sigdrif in this slot again. Instead, again, it's just an alternative idea. Sigdrif is kind of nice in the mirror and can help you achieve some things. Although ultimately most of the value you're getting out of Holger and Drag are going to be in round one, so Sigdrifa might prove to be a little less useful given that. We've obviously got the Coral, a uh, huge value of Skellige, and we're trying out the Wild Boar here. Uh, Wild Boar is going to be giving us value every single turn, and uh, if we draw it later, it might not necessarily be a problem because this deck can output so much value later that it doesn't necessarily care about dead draws in round three. Um, we have the Operator to clone the Queen's Guards, more is on that later. And if nothing else, you can always clone a Shield Maiden. This card is very high value, uh, and you basically, you can actually play this later than round one in a lot of scenarios that now due to the new Mulligan mechanic, and you can make really good use out of its veteran tag in that way. Ultimately, a uh, pretty powerful card, always achieves great value. Holger Black Hand, again, always achieves great value, buff up the Queen's Guards in the graveyard, and outside of that it's a 5 deal 5, which is pretty good value for a silver. It's decoyable. And as our uh, Drake Bondu, strengthens your Queen's Guards and Grimmest. Um, I've tried a lot of things out in this list. I have tried Ceres, but ultimately, after some extensive testing, I found that Drake Bondu effectively does her job a little better and makes her redundant. This list, like the Dwarfs list, is basically all about leveraging two things. It's all about leveraging your ability to win round one with your amount of carryover in future rounds, right? If you go too greedily and put too much carryover in future rounds, you're not going to be able to win round one ever, and that can be really problematic for the list. So ultimately, as you can see here, uh, Sigdrif has a decent uh, consideration for a bond slot if you want an alternative. There's nothing really wrong with Donar if you uh, want to be able to lock things. And as far as gold slots go, uh, I had Lugos in for a while, I had Ceres, I had Hjalmar, uh, but this is what I'm trying right now, and like I said, I would trust the Gwent DB list first and foremost, because that's what I'm going to keep updated in terms of what I think at any given time is going to be the best variant. Um, in terms of a uh, crafting order, you can find them on the Gwent DB guide, it's all there, uh, crafting order uh, and budget version, anyway jump into some games now. Let's see how that goes. Okay, we get into our first game here. Uh, this is going to be Queen's Guards versus the uh, Bruver matchup. Bruver, we might assume is dwarfs, although could be a few things as well. Uh, it's not the spell deck because it's not Ithony. Uh, we've got three Queen's Guards in hand that we're going to be looking to get rid of here, so let's just kick these off. And we've got a Freya. We could blacklist it, although keeping it as a one of isn't bad. 
And we've got the Scald that we can get rid of as well. Although we haven't seen another Shield Maiden, so we'd probably be better off just getting rid of this, uh, get, or sorry, getting out of this mulligan altogether. Forces us to go first, and of course we have the opportunity to uh, brand off all of our stuff early. Okay. Let's so just uh, brand it out. Me or me. <laughs> so we brand uh, two Queen's Guards and the Raider. And uh, the Raider's gonna spawn. Uh, we could start with a Wild Boar on the right side of the Raider, which will start buffing it up, and then we could transition that into playing a Queen's Guard to so, so we can make the power. The problem therein is that Queen's Guards, uh, additional Queen's Guards will spawn on the right side of the row which means the wild boar will start damaging them and it won't be generating me as much value as I would like in that case so we can just uh, use Drake Mondu here there's nothing wrong with this play he has a line to pass and force me to go a second card down although it doesn't really do that much for him and he's a dwarf deck so he wouldn't really pass here Uh, so basically the play here is Ragnarug. Ultimately we're going to Ragnarug. Uh, we expect him to clear it immediately. If he clears it immediately we trade up for 6. So there's the clear. So we trade up for 6. Uh, it looks like he's coming out on top there. He's not. It's relatively close to an even trade if anything I'm on top. But what's going to happen is now I have the line to hold your block hand down the Yarpen which is a very big play. So Ragnarug achieved really massive value in that scenario because it enabled a really good line of play and of course uh, both my or not both my queen's guards but one of the queen's guards got buffed off of that there's the dwarf coming in there uh, dwarfs have a pretty good win rate in theory over queen's guards because they are able to two round very effectively in a way that I can't really stop uh, so I guess we pull out the queen's guards and start buffing them with boat is that proper We want that defender dead, but I guess it's Queen's Guard's time. You're good. Real good. Uh, I've get I'm not sure how this boat is as a card. I might end up replacing it between these games. It can be uh, definitely somewhat unreliable. You kind of have to. You end up having to play it a little bit late, and it's a little bit lackluster if you do have to play it late. Like, you'd really like to uh, be able to play turn one here, so. Naturally, we have the Grimace to be able to shut this down, so. We will be doing that. And we've got our own Drought to start wreaking havoc on his board. We would like him f uh, to occupy the range draw first, but he's a dwarf. Dwarfs don't really occupy range draw. That being said, it's it doesn't really matter about initial damage. Either he can clear this or he can't. If he can't clear this, then we win the round because of the nature of our, uh, just because it gives too much value. And if he can clear this, then we expect him to win the round anyway, regardless of whether it hits for that three extra value, simply because his, ooh, he can't clear it. Presumably. Huh. That's interesting. That makes this round vaguely winnable. I could shield Maiden to smack off a few things. It's still really, really hard to outvalue him here, though. And again, our ship's giving us points of return. Let's shield Maiden to smack off a few things. And of course, even though this is hitting armor, it's uh, it's generating value because it's allowing our drought to hit for more. Let's do this. This basically, uh, it looks like I lost a bit of damage to drought but ultimately if I had left that as a 4 the drought would have hit it as a 1 which would have been even worse and he lost the commander swarm target off of that as well which is pretty significant so at this point we could pass and force him to go one card down this is probably our last opportunity to do that playing the scald so we're gaining 4 points passively because of drought and because of wild boar of the sea so we can imagine scald therefore as a 14 point play instead of a 10 point play which is really great 
But if he beats 14, then we're out the round. And he can do that very easily with Ithlin. Ithlin is his line to beat 14. Basically, Scalds is the proper play here if he doesn't have Ithlin, and it's a waste if he does. Hmm, that's interesting. We assume the Ithlin, I think. Although, that being said, I'm not sure we have a win condition if he does have the Ithlin. I'm honestly just going to play the uh, Scald back here. So, if he doesn't have the Ithlin, then we're in a really great position here. He has a really hard time, like, forcing us out of this round if he doesn't have the Ithlin. Even a uh, Zuldan Shive doesn't end up doing very much here. And he can't drag enough units that the Drought wouldn't be able to do a lot, so... It's basically Ithlin or Bust for him. Looks like he does not have it, or he's possibly a little scared of our last card, but we will be taking the first round, which is absolutely huge for us as the Queen's Guards. That's basically game. It's really hard for him to take this now, because we're just going to have so much value in round three that he's not really going to be able to match. Savage Bear loses a lot of value at this stage in the game, so we can kick it for something else. Wouldn't mind a Coral triple medic. So obviously one of these medics is going to be hitting our queen's guards and the other one's going to hit a skull. The third one, not sure entirely what it's going to hit. So how much value are we getting out of these queen's guards? We're getting uh, 4, 11, and 13 since we didn't do an operator. So 4, 11, and 13 obviously adds up to 28. So it's a 29 point play, but he can stay ahead of that pretty easily. Like really easily. The proper play is probably just a pass here. And we're going one card down into the next round, but we have a lot more point potential. We're not gaining anything by trying to stay ahead of him. If we play this big, massive point play with the Queen's Guards, he can stay ahead of us with his third defender. Once he stays ahead of us with his third defender, no matter what we do after that point, he can stay ahead of us with, um... I guess we could kick a fray on this opportunity since we're out of res targets. Um, that's fine. It, it, it's just a very risky proposition to stay into that round, given the fact that once we play our move, his points are still high enough to be able to stay ahead of us with a single defender, which he had one more of in, uh, I guess, the deck since he just uh, rallied it out. Ends up blocking the bear. Is that my decoy? I mean, I only need two medics, right? Question is, how worth it is decoying the bear? It's not. He didn't lock the bear because the bear was a threat. He locked the bear because he knew it was the last... He, it was the only, like, real lockable target in my entire deck. Like, decoy on Freya for shield maiden is worth more than decoy on bear here. Bow before Mark so, Freya. we'll just play it out. He is gonna have last to play, though. Could be awkward if he has any way to really control our power. Pansy. Ithlin could actually end up beating our value. Ithlin provides a really ridiculous amount of points, and we would like to be able to control him more than he would like to be able to control us in this scenario. So the next step is to raise the skull, I guess. Modern Freyre is patient, but she brooks no insult. Uh huh. That's interesting. That presents an interesting mathematical problem, which is. No matter where I scald, these two Queen's Guards, assuming I get full value out of it, these two Queen's Guards are going to be lined up for Igni. That being said, if he has an Igni, uh, we should lose regardless. Though we will always have the uh, decoy. Either way, it doesn't matter where we scald. So, last card, uh, Ithlin will be taking this game from us. We expect a last card, Zoldan Shive, however. Modern Freyr is patient, but she brooks no insult. Yeah. I expect his last card was Zoldan Shive. It's the one he was holding onto in round one, and he probably wouldn't have passed like that if it was Ithlin. Um, anyway, that was the first match. It was a little bit lucky there. If he had, a, if he had Ithlin, we probably would have lost in round one. But ultimately, uh, it was still a good demonstration of the deck's ability to put out that much power. Okay. We get into our second game here, and interestingly enough, we seem to be against the uh, Squirtel uh, spell-only list, which, uh, I mean, that's generally what you assume with Ithne. Uh Some people actually run br 
the I think with like a dwarf deck instead of river, but we expect it to be a squid tail spell only list. Which is something that this deck has a bit of a tricky time against. Hmm. Could keep the warrior since we don't have the Lugos. And Savage Bear is just going to be completely dead against that list. Since they don't really place uh, units. We know it's the Squirtel list if he opens Yaven. consideration. It's basically a very reactive list. It's 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 sort of like this game's version of Freeze Mage. It doesn't seem to be that though. I mean you would never rally turn one with that list. So it's either something kind of similar. It could still be a spell list but it's not like the kind of all-in spell list that people are playing. Okay. So it, it, it does in fact just turn out to be a relatively normal squad tell list, probably utilizing some kind of buffs with Dragoons. Uh, I'm sure he has Brigand for sure. So we'll start off by playing Bear, just generally our best proactive play. Uh, you might notice that we ended up actually changing one or two cards here. Um, we took out the Wild Boar. It wasn't... It was something I was trying out but it didn't end up actually working out really well that was that for us. So um we've got the Holger to kill that. It's a shame it was able to come down before the bear, otherwise Holger would have been able to kill it immediately. Um Fog is a little annoying as well. We basically have to clear that. That is your brilliant mate. I mean, we're, we can't really play outside the melee row. Normally if my bear is fogged, then I could kind of possibly consider choosing to sacrifice the bear instead of clearing that. And of course the drought is gonna kill off the Grimmest. And we have decoy and not sick drift in this hand. So we no longer have an out to remove this weather. But we're still one card up, so we won't have to go more than one card down here. Or uh we, we won't have to lose on even cards since we won the coin flip. Uh winning the coin flip takes a lot of the risk out of the situation, ultimately. Like you can think of the coin flip as sort of assigning roles to the player. And when you're when you won the coin flip, you're sort of on offense, kind of. Which is to say, you can force the opponent into a bad situation. And like, well, when you lose, when you win the coin flip like that, you can kind of like. There's kind of a floor for how bad your scenario can be. Like, normally, if I had won the coin flip with this much pressure on the board, he could have forced a win on even cards. But since I lost the coin flip, there's a limit to how much he can actually force out of us. He'll never be able to force us down on even cards. I'd like to have our Hjalmar variant at this point. You'll note that I'm going through, like, you know, several... Uh, variations of this list really quickly you know I'm I might end up like making a couple tweaks to this list um, after this game as well and the biggest thing to take away from that is that like there's no really one solid list that basically any list have to follow I mean certain lists are more flexible than others it looks like we're probably gonna be interested in passing here I mean this is a consideration to push with Freya I'm getting not very much out of that though and I could also push with my own spells. Modern I'll Freya push with Freya. But she brooks no insult. You're good. Real good. It forces him to keep up. I'm losing four points between the turns, so all it forces him to do is play a seven or higher. Storm is coming. Whoa, that's risky. He could, in theory, see some options that don't allow him to stay ahead, and, and this is one of those. So. He only plays a three-point play. Obviously, the Merc is dying, but this forces an extra card out of him, which is great. And obviously, our Queen's Guard took one point of damage, but that doesn't really matter that much. So, uh, we can, at this point, feel much more comfortable about passing. So, it was good that we pushed there. We forced an extra card out of him. He took a risky move. It didn't pay off. And obviously, yeah, I'm one strength down on my Queen's Guard, but that would have happened regardless of the turn or the round that it happened on. And as long as it doesn't kill my Queen's Guard, She's still generating the extra points from the veteran. Marjo can be kind of awkward when it snipes off one of your Queen's Guards and they stop growing, but ultimately it's totally fine here. But yeah. Anyway, it's it's important to remember that lists are flexible. And I might actually end up changing between this game and the last game just to just to showcase a slightly different variant. Like there's several things that I'm interested in trying out. I don't know, card games, I, I guess many games in general, but card games are so fundamentally strategic that it kind of becomes all about, like, experimentation. 
Like, you kind of... You can't really play without, like, at least, like, you know, thinking about the different options, etc. So, I can't just play Savage Bear here. Uh, it's a pretty free way of taking the round. Or I could play my Warrior. My Warrior has the Veteran Tag, meaning it's coming out as a 9 strength in the next round. And he is a control list, like, he's running spells. We expect this bear to be killed off immediately. Uh, like, he's, you know, he's an Ithanilis, he's got Alice's Thunder, he's got Mercs. He's got all kinds of aggressive spells. We don't expect this bear to live and gain value, so... We'll just play it here. Getting maybe more value out of the warrior, which is at least a little harder to kill. The warrior's value isn't contingent on him surviving in the same way. Like, obviously, every, every card's value is kind of contingent on them surviving, or what they do surviving, but... He's harder to remove. So we've got uh, the last Shield Maiden, and we want to get out of this hand. There's nothing we can kick that doesn't risk us drawing a Shield Maiden, so we won't take the risk. We've got Drought and Ragnarok, which is fantastic for a round 3 scenario, because pre presumably he'll be able to clear one. In fact, we know he'll be able to clear at least one, because he's got a First Light in his Graveyard, and he's got the Ithony ability. Rally is something we can't really do until we put the Shield Maiden out. I'll open by playing a Warrior here. It's a decently proactive play. We've got half a card advantage here, which is, of course, great, as it always is. There's his Dragoon. Uh, we can't smash that with our Black Hand, unfortunately. It's just out of our range. Could someone's Queen's Guards. We don't really want to weather yet. We'll just open by summoning Queen's Guards here. Uh, he shouldn't have an amazing way to remove this or to punish this. Like, yeah, he could hurt us with something like a Lacerate or a Manticore Venom. In fact, he could run a lot more spells than we give him credit for. Yeah, that's fine. We've got a clear for it. That being said, he does have Ifni, so he does have the ability to play another one if he chooses to. Wow. Yeah, he's full weather. That makes the Holger pretty useless, because the Holger is in a row that we can't necessarily control, which is pretty bad. That being said, I could use the Holger to trigger my Shield Maidens, which isn't necessarily awful. We'll just start doing the same thing. Heavy control list can hurt the uh, the Queen's Guard list. One thing that really, really this list really wishes it had was a uh, w would be a uh, single row clear skies effect that every other uh, faction has attached to a unit, which is uh, Arch Griffin, Blue Stripe Scout. Uh, uh, is it Vreehead Brigade? Yeah, it's Vreehead Brigade, right? It's the uh, it's Texas bugged out right now, but it clear skies, and then of course the. Um, the Nilfgaard one, the Nausicaa Standard Bear. Skellige doesn't currently have one of those. I feel like it will end up getting one at some point. It kind of has to. So we'll Ragnarok here. He could clear this again with Ithni. If nothing else, there's always a consideration for Dukoing this Clan Crate Warrior. It heals it back up a lot. Which is pretty useful. Starts tanking Ragnarug more. I mean, our melee row isn't all gonna die to this Ragnarug, so. He could clear it with Ithany, but he's giving off a lot of power from his hand if he does that. That being said, if he pulls Sasuke out with Ithany, that's a little scary, and we probably expect the Sasuke to come out with Ithany. Those, um. So. He'll take off the shield, making it vulnerable to Quirrell. So he has to either play into Coral or play spacing his dudes out, which makes them vulnerable to Ragnarok. Hopefully he doesn't end up playing around the Coral. If he doesn't play around the Coral, we could be in a, a very good position here. If he just tries to play reducing the Ragnarok's value. 
He could be inclined, inclined to clear it. Yeah, that looks like a clear. I don't think there's any other spell he's casting here. Rally. Nature's gift for something. He could just rally and ignore it. Goes ahead and clears it. He'll spread out the rows now. We'll be able to find Coral on something, but it's going to be hard to match that amount of power. I mean, we expect at the very least two more protectors. That one has a shield. The shield, uh, it says ignoring armor, but I'm pretty sure it uh, doesn't get it. It's basically the same, right? I mean, hitting this one is probably better. Hitting that one is only one point. It's the same, actually. Hitting this one allows my coral to hit for one more point. Hitting this one uh, prevents my coral from hitting one more point, and I'm giving out two points for the shield maiden, so it's the same amount of uh, points either way, regardless of what I do. So I do have a coral, but the Ragnar is just going to end up destroying me here. Very hard when you play this list and you uh, just get so controlled by what the enemy does like that. It's a list that, like I said, would really, really benefit from having that uh, single clear on weather. And with the rising popularity of this Squirtle control list, Queen's Guards might have a, a bit of a rough time moving forward, but we'll see. Okay, looks like this third game we are against just another one of these. Uh, I didn't end up changing the list at all, like I said I might. Um, we're against another Ithne player. Um, we might end up uh, playing against the same deck. Ultimately, there's kind of a s uh, several different ways to play that Ithne deck right now. Three Queen's Guards. Several different variations on kind of the same idea. So we'll see which variation it is. No shield. Uh, Shield Maidens yet. Got a Freya to kick. Drake Bundy for the discard. Freya is not so necessary here. We need it less because, of course, we've got the Queen's Guard from hand. In certain certain games, if you either don't have the Operator or if the Operator is useless, well, I guess basically you don't have the Operator because in the Mirror matchup you mulligan away the Operator, but basically if you end up not having the Operator either by not drawing it or mulliganing it away, um, you're kind of incentivized to get rid of the third Queen's Guard and use Bran on the three Queen's Guards. There's the Epidemic. Using Bran on the three Queen's Guards and just resing them with Freya, but we've got a hand that takes us in a different direction. Could fog that. Fogging that's kind of cute. It can kind of lock us out of being able to clear his weather though, which is a really big problem. We can't really afford that. I'll just go in the Queen's Guards here. You're good. Real good. Burn out the other two, and we'll pick up the Raider on top of that. Make sure you don't discard shield maidens. I've done that once or twice. Where you just brand and shield maidens look kind of like queen's guards in certain arts. You're just not really looking that closely. Don't do that. That's that's embarrassing. Um, let's get like a storm on these. So he wants to kill those off, and of course I can't really let him destroy my melee row like that. So presumably I have to play Grimace to clear, and unfortunately he's not protected by anything on the Seedra, which means we expect a Ragnarok or a Drought here, sniping off our Grimace, preventing the decoy, which is unfortunate. In this narrow situation, we really wish we had the um, Seedra instead of the decoy. I mean, it didn't end up happening here, but for the situation where the Grimace ends up being sniped off like that, because everyone's running Ragnarok and Drought right now, we do wish we had the Seedra instead of the decoy. Uh, Seedra is pretty good in this list as well. And given the fact that we're running Ragnarok and Drought in this particular variant, we should have Sigdrif instead of the Roach. If you're running, I, I do actually like Roach if you're running only one of Ragnarok and Drought, but if you're running both, Sigdrif is the better call. Or possibly a third option. So, uh, we can't just Drake Bondu here. Rain doesn't have to bother us yet. 
And the Drake Bandu is protecting the Grammist from Ragnarok, not Drought, and that's part of the reason why some people are running Drought instead. The ability to snipe off these mages without anything blocking them is pretty powerful, preventing the clearing of it. Mm. And Drake, of course, protecting off the Skellige Storm as well. So I'm always going to decoy the Grammist and clear that. Of course, locking myself out of the option to decoy the Drake, but that's fine. Decoying the Grammist is a necessity here. Because the rain on the melee row is kind of hurting us as well. So we've got Ragnar, we've got the Queen's Guards coming out, and we do have some Shield Maiden combo. The Shield Maidens are going to be able to find value killing off his units, because of course the Ragnar is going to damage some stuff, which is a little extra synergy it has with this list, which is cool. Our Coil is achieving great value in the Seed Row. I think he put this on the wrong row. He was probably playing outside of Ragnar and didn't want to put it ranged, but he probably should have put it in melee at the same time. Uh, he gave us a little extra value out of Coral there. Um, we don't necessarily have to opt for it yet. But the sooner we play Queen's Guards, the easier he can control them. And he's not going to play anything else in that row. So yeah, why not? We'll just play Coral here. This isn't going to pull out our Roach. Goes on the Siege Row. That's fine. It's probably better that uh, we played Coral on the Siege Row to kind of protect these units from the potential like Manticore Venom. I don't really expect this list to run Manticore Venom or anything like that, but this is probably the best place to protect Coral in terms of protecting our like adjacent units from being controlled. He does play this Shiru, uh, giving him the Scorch. I believe there is like uh, audi audible like confirmation that he did take the Scorch. I think you can tell whether he declines this or not, although at this point in the you know, open beta I'm not 100% sure. So taking the Scorch is slightly awkward for me, uh, resing the shield made to the 7. Now this protector, it goes after the spell, right? Which means he would be able to Scorch my 2 if he did really want to. You're good. Ultimately, the thing to understand about Ragnar and Drought is it might seem super weird saving them this long, but ultimately, due to the round system in Gwent, you never really need to use them that early. Because, I mean, it seems like I'm kind of missing out on passive value by waiting, but ultimately, uh, how it always... Uh, doesn't matter what I hit. Hitting this is probably better so that this is a Ragnarok target, as is this. How it ultimately ends up working is that, like, if they don't clear the weather, you're going to win the round anyway. So there's kind of no pressure to play it that early. We can play it here. He's possibly less able to clear it. You just use this first light. Like, Ragnarok deals so much damage so fast, and you're never going to be that far uh, behind your opponent. Okay. So we forced out his entire combo, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, yeah, he won the round, but he went one card down. We have a huge investment with the four Queen's Guards, one of which being in our hand to summon out the others. And we forced them out of his entire combo. This was kind of his win condition. So that's good. But yeah, Ragnarok and Drought, like... Unless you're so far behind that you do actually need the snowballing amount of points, which is very rare you're generally going to be close enough to behind, which is like within 25 points or so, where you can afford to like, you know, just play for a better Ragnarok or Drought. You always assume that they get cleared immediately, in other words. You assume that they get cleared immediately, because in the event that they don't get cleared immediately, you're going to win the round in, at most, one turn extra anyway. So it doesn't end up mattering. So, um... Let's play the bear here. Doesn't really matter. So he did generate card advantage. He is going to get the last play going to the next round, but there's really only so much that's going to do for him, right? Uh, he's used all of his protectors, and he didn't even get to save any of his possibly very good cards going into the next round. So I've got the Lugos. Uh, this is a perfect hand. I've got the Lugos for this warrior. Now, he is veteran up to 10, so this Lugos is a 17-point play. Got the Queen's Guards to pull out by the Queen's Guards. And I've got the Freya for, I guess, uh, Raider. It's a little unfortunate, but... Swapping the Freya out is something I could have done. Might have been an additional point or two, but... Joe has a really limited amount of uh, reliability in this round. And if I find the first light, that's actually worse than the Freya. Because, um... If I find the first light, that's even worse than the Freya. Just, uh... 
simply because I have to use the first light before the, I okay so basically I don't want to use Lugos until later because he's not going to give me a target to hit until later in fact given his deck oh he just gave me a target to hit never mind but um, anyway he has the last play so we're never going to get the Lugos off after something big like a Brayan so we're just going to Lugos this now uh, but basically if if we had the first light instead of the Freya we're kind of incentivized the first light at that Freya point of time but then if we pull the warrior which isn't a Freya then we're kind of screwed out of our opportunity to Lugos for value he goes ahead and concedes there so actually we were able to force a really good amount of him out of round one when you are playing against these Ithony decks that are using these Dolblathana protectors the most most important thing to remember is that you just end up uh, forcing them out of round one, basically. Like, you don't don't give them any leverage at all into round one. Just keep pushing. Don't give up round one because they'll always beat you in a single card. They'll always use, you know, Ithony, Saskia. Some variants run Breaver as well. Uh, Ithony, Saskia, Roach combo beat you. And once they win round one, then it's a lot harder to take the game from them. Uh, but yeah, this is my current iteration of the deck. And as I mentioned in that, that game just now, since I am running Ragnarok and Drought, which I'm not necessarily... Um, confident is best. Like I said, there's a lot of very minor variations, and I'm going to keep the one on Gwenty B uploaded with what I think is, in general, in a very broad sense, going to be the best version, but if you want to run this version, then you would run Sigdrif instead, because Roach doesn't come out with Silver Weathers, so he's harder to pull in general, and Sigdrif is a decent card. Um, not sure if there's any way to fit her in otherwise. Anyway, uh, this was my Queensguard's deck. I would probably recommend this variant over the one I started with. I was experimenting with Wild Boar and uh, some stuff. But it turned out to be slightly awkward. Wild Boar doesn't really have huge synergy with the list, as I suspected, and that's why I didn't really include him to the Quentin B guide. But anyway, uh, if you want to see more, you can, like I said before, find that guide in the description of this video. And I'll see you guys next time.